seated. Oh, to understand the love of God. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Think of the very worst person you can imagine. Hitler, Stalin, Genghis Khan, some rapist in Camden. Who's the worst person you can imagine? Would you love them enough to die for them? And how much greater is the love of God? Christ came into the world to save sinners. The Holy God became a man to die for you and for me. That is incredible. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn back to that passage in Exodus chapter 4. Verse 13 is what we're looking at today, looking at it, of course, in the context of the immediate preceding three verses, which we read just a few moments ago. Disobeying God. Excuse number two is the title of the message. Moses is busy arguing with God and giving excuses why he could not possibly do what God has told him to do. Amazing. To think that a mere man, a mere flea on the surface of a tiny speck of dust in a universe created by the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God is willing to argue with God. But you and I do it every day. That's what we find going on here in this passage as we look at Exodus chapter 4. And you recall last week the first excuse that uh, <laughs> Moses made was that he was not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since. Thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses claimed, as you remember, to have two different kinds of limitations. First, he claimed to have a physical incapacity, an incapacity that is evident and obvious to other people, and an incapacity that means he cannot accomplish what other people can accomplish. And the second argument he had was that he implied that he had a mental incapacity. He's not a quick thinker. He can't think on his feet. I am slow of speech and slow tongue. He's telling God that he can't talk and tie his shoes at the same time. He can't answer the verbal challenges that he knows will be thrown at him when he comes in to uh, speak to Pharaoh. And that goes back, of course, to the false premise that we already discussed, assuming that success depends on ourselves rather than knowing that success depends upon God. Now, I'd like to add something here that we did not discuss last week, but I think it's very important to understanding Moses' next argument, but it connects us to the first argument that he makes against God. Moses is actually calling God a liar, and Moses is himself lying about his own capabilities. Listen to what Stephen says about Moses in his sermon in Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 17. Stephen is here preaching, and you know how Stephen's uh, sermon ends in Stephen being stoned to death. They don't like what they hear. But Stephen is giving them history of Israel from God's perspective. Stephen is speaking under the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says so in the text. It says that when they looked at him, it was like looking on the face of an angel. He, he radiated, he glowed with glory from God. So as Stephen is preaching, he's preaching the truth. Remember that as we hear what he says about Moses. Beginning in verse 17. For when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. And you recall how that was taking place uh, where all the Hebrews were obeying the law of the land to kill their children. Time may come, folks, like it has in China, where the United States says you've got to kill your unborn babies. you got to abort those unborn babies because we don't want them here in our country. Remember, it'll be the same test, though accomplished by a slightly different method, that the test was back in ancient Egypt. They wanted to keep the girl babies alive, but they wanted to kill the boy babies. In China, they kill the girl babies and want to keep the boy babies. 
a little different there, but still the same principle. It might happen here in the United States. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Now imagine, I know all of you have seen three-month-old babies. They are adorable. So cute, you can hardly believe it. We got a, a photo that was texted to us last night by Daniel and Anastasia of dear little Patrick. He's just about that age right now. He is so adorable. Absolutely cute. <laughs> okay, Moses was three months old when this is going on. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now listen to verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and in deed. Did you get that? It says he was mighty in words, not just in deeds. And this was before he headed into the wilderness. Look at the next few verses. Verse 23, the very next verse says, And when he was full 40 years old. So in other words, this is taking place back from the time he was three months old to 40. It summarizes it for us. That 40-year period of time, he was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. He knew his calling already. He knew his purpose already. He started about it in his own way, and that was the problem. When God calls Moses in the wilderness and tells him what he wants him to do, Moses, 40 years earlier, already knew the calling that God had placed on his life. It tells me something else. There was once a lady in this church, she's not here anymore, but there was once a lady in this church who told me on several occasions that when she was a young person, God had called her to go to the mission field. God had very clearly made it known to her that she was supposed to be a missionary. And she said, I'm not going to do it. And so now she's bragging to me, and I said, well, you know, if God put that call on your life, and if it was truly God's call for your life, you'd better get with it and do it now. She was in the same position as Moses. She's telling me that 40 or 50 years after God gave her a call, she still knew that was God's call, but she wasn't going to do it. That's what's going on here. Moses knew his calling. It says, very clearly it says to us, that he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. What do other people think? Remember we talked about that. That was one of Moses' problems. He was worried about what other people would think. They didn't understand God, so, hey, I tried it once, I'm not going to do it again. It failed the first time, it must not be your will. God is talking to him personally at the burning bush and telling him, Moses, I have not forgotten the commission that I gave to you. You may be trying to get out of it, but you are going to be the one. Your friend, has God ever spoken to you in your life? Given you some direction that you tried and it didn't work? And so you decided, well, I'm going to give up on it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Be careful. You're in the shoes of Moses. Be careful. You may find that God's anger comes against you. In the verse after the last verse that we've just read, it says, God is angry with Moses. You don't want to go there. He supposed, too often we suppose things that aren't the case. He supposed his brethren would have understood. Look, here I am. Look at all the training I've got. Look at all the, the abilities I've got. Look at all the money I've got. Don't you realize I'm God's gift to you? <laughs> Moses 
thought that. He thought that they would understand, obviously, he's the man that God would use to deliver them. But God didn't want Moses in that condition, being the deliverer. God needed to humble Moses for a period of 40 years before Moses would be qualified to deliver God's people. Instead of wearing gold and jewels and precious stones and riding in a chariot and having other people bow down to him and fan him while he popped grapes into his mouth at lunch, he would be straggling around the desert with a bunch of stinky, smelly sheep and would have gotten accustomed to it. You see, God may have called you and God is going to use you, but you have to be first where God wants you to be. And you have to be in a position whereby you understand your own inadequacies. And you have to be humble about it. Moses' humility has turned into stubbornness. Moses' pride has been hurt. God, why didn't you do something with me back then? Hey, I was 40 years younger. Think of all the things I could have accomplished in that 40-year period. Wow, we could already be across the desert even if we had to wander for 40 years. We'd be going into the promised land right now. Never question God. Learn to obey Him. Learn to obey Him quickly and with humility. And then see what He will do. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. That brings us to the text. Exodus 3, Exodus 4, which is where we are. So when Moses says, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, in other words, I never was eloquent, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue, he was lying. Stephen said so in that sermon in Acts chapter 7. He was lying. He was calling God a liar because the Bible says that he was eloquent and mighty in words. Even if we try to give Moses a break, at the very least he was assuming that God had a bad memory or wasn't around in Egypt while Moses was ex exercising his eloquence. The best we can do for Moses is to assume that he was the one with a faulty memory. He was the one who didn't remember his own eloquence. Or maybe he was trying to argue that he hadn't spoken Egyptian for 40 years and so he was kind of rusty in the language. But I doubt seriously if he could have gotten away with that excuse either. You know, if you can get away with false premises, you can always arrive at a false answer. Let me try that again. If you can get away with false premises, you can always arrive at a false answer. Now, I hope some of you saw the creation debate this past week between Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis and Bill Nye, the science guy at Creation Museum in Kentucky. Uh, it was a well-attended and well-moderated event. Original estimates of the viewers were over one million people. Now that the final tally is in, there were over three million viewers of that debate. I suspect that most of you didn't even know that the debate was going on because you consider this to be an unimportant issue and you don't regularly access the creationist websites. Our home page on our computer when you turn it on is the Institute for Creation Research. And I am signed up to get regularly all the emails from Answers in Genesis and from CMI, Creation Ministries International so that I can keep in touch with what is happening in the creation community. You need to sign up and get on those lists. You need to put one of them as your home page. 
Dear people, this is the issue in the United States today which is destroying our young people and leading most of them, 85% or more, to abandon their faith when they graduate from high school. You say, well, my kids wouldn't do that. My grandkids wouldn't do that. Oh, no. You'd better be careful about it. You better make them armed and articulate in the issue. Because even if they go to a Christian college, so-called, they will run into theistic evolution, which is a stupid idea, certainly contrary to Scripture. Dear people, that was a very important debate. There are millions of people on both sides who want to know the answer. It is not a little issue. Three million listened in to that debate. Afterwards, there were a lot of extensive analyses done of the debate from both sides. They're posted online. You can find them. I've read many of them this past week. One of the more interesting commentaries pointed out, and you'll see that where I'm going with this in just a second because it ties in directly with what Moses is doing here in our text. One of the more interesting commentaries pointed out that Bill Nye refused to stick to the actual debate proposition, but instead reverted to a logical fallacy known as the all-true Scots argument. It goes like this. Scotsman number one asserts, Scotsmen do not put sugar on their porridge. Scotsman number two replies, well, I'm a Scotsman and I put sugar on my porridge. To which Scotsman number one replies, no true Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. In other words, by redefining Scotsman as someone who eats porridge without sugar, Scotsman number one eliminates all possibilities of ever being proved wrong. He's able to start with a false premise, and if you can start with a false premise, you can always arrive at a false answer. You see, he's never going to be proved wrong if you admit his definition. No evidence to the contrary is admitted, but in real life, the term Scotsman is defined by much more than whether or not a man uses sugar on his porridge. If that were the only true test of a true Scotsman, then an Eskimo that uses sugar on his porridge would be considered a Scotsman. Do you understand this? This is real simple. This is very simple. Bill Nye insisted that all real scientists believe in evolution and that no true scientist believes in creation, even though Ken Ham listed very many competent scientists who believe in creation. Therefore, by insisting on his false premise, Bill Nye could only arrive at false conclusions, and he was hoping that the general audience would be swept along and not catch his logical fallacy. Now back to our text. God didn't let Moses get away with his false premise, which tells us that he won't let you get away with your false premises that make excuses designed to get you off the hook of his call on your life. Last week we gave examples of how many of us have assumed the false premise that success depends on us. And we went through different things related to money and so on and noted in Deuteronomy 8.18 that it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. That is the premise. And the reason for it is that he might establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Financial success doesn't depend on us. It depends on God and God can make it disappear overnight and we talked about why God does that. He tells us in Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. So don't ever come to God with the excuse that you have human limitations when God commands you to do something in his word. And there are a lot of commands in the Word of God. There are a lot of prohibitions in the Word of God. Not all of them apply to you, like he doesn't tell you to go out and kill the Amalekites. But a lot of them do apply to you. Like love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
Or like, owe no man anything but to love one another, for love is the fulfilling of the law. Or flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Or let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands, working the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth it. We go on and on and on and on. There are many commands that apply to us. We discovered that when God commands us to do something, three things happen. Number one, he makes a way to do it. Number two, he gives you the power to do it. Number three, he shows you step by step how you personally fit into the plan. We saw that most of the time the reasons we don't want to obey fall into four categories. Number one, we're lazy and slothful. Number two, we're covetous of the resources that God has entrusted to us and only want to spend them on ourselves. Number three, we're walking in the flesh and catering to the old sin nature. Number four, we're proud and think we know better ways to use the resources, including our time, that God hasn't thought of. So, when we look at what Moses is answering God here in our text, Moses is accusing God of making some mistakes, and Moses is accusing God of lying. That's serious business, to come to God and make accusations like that. You know, God, it's your fault because you made me the way that I was made. God, it's your fault because you haven't changed the problem. It wasn't the good way before, and it's not the good way now, and I don't think it'll be the good way in the future. Moses is the one who's forgotten that he was eloquent. Moses is the one who's forgotten that he was powerful and that God made him so and God took it away from him so that God could teach him that God is the reason for success, not us. Oh, that we would learn that. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or the blind, have not I the Lord? The real issue was obedience obedience. And we went over many, many passages of Scripture, many passages of Scripture that dealt with the issue of obedience. And then today, and he said, O Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. You know, I don't know about you, but as I read through this text, it boggles my mind that Moses is still arguing with God by the time we get to verse 13. Even after God has told Moses that God himself said in the immediate preceding verse, Therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou wilt say. Think about God for a moment. If God can control the course of a river, or the course of the earth, or the sun, or the moon, or the stars, does Moses think that God is powerful, not powerful enough, to make Moses' gums back together and make noises come out of Moses' mouth? <laughs> if God can tell the stars what to do, he certainly can make Moses' jaw go up and down and sounds come out of Moses' throat. Does Moses really think that God is such a bad teacher that he can't teach anything to Moses? He says, I will teach thee what thou shalt say. Oh, really, God? Don't you realize how dumb I am? You couldn't possibly teach me anything. Or the other is true. Don't you realize how smart I am? You couldn't teach me anything. What an arrogant thing for Moses to say. And yet we say that same kind of thing to God when we argue with God, when we refuse to do what God has told us to do. No, the real problem is that Moses is stubborn and Moses is disobedient and he doesn't want the job. Sounds like us. We're stubborn. We're disobedient. We don't want the job that God gave us. We want some other job. Like that in the early church at Corinth. They didn't like the spiritual gifts that God had given them. They wanted the charismatic gifts. When I fall on the floor and somebody comes to you and like it. They all wanted to speak in tongues. They all wanted to interpret tongues. They all wanted miracles. They all wanted the gift of healings. You know, that was like Simon the sorcerer, remember? He was astounded when he followed and saw what the apostles were doing. And he said, hey, I'll give you money if you'll, you'll give me the power that on whomever I lay hands, they'll get the Holy Spirit. Peter said, your money perish with you. You thought the gift of God could be bought with money? 
God knows the bitterness that's in your heart, and God revealed it to Peter. God knows the bitterness that's in your heart. You better pray that God will forgive you, otherwise you're going to get smacked dead. And he said, oh, pray the Lord for me that none of these things that you've spoken will come upon me. Dear people, we need to learn to be satisfied with what God has given us and then take what God has given us and use it to the maximum for His glory. Maximize your potential. Maximize your potential. Say, thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. I've already wasted this much of my life. Help me to pick up what I've got now and keep me moving forward. Don't stop. If you stop, the race is over. Well, we learned that in cross-country years ago. Keep putting one foot ahead of the other. Keep putting one foot ahead of the other. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep running until you cross the finish line and then run to the chute so nobody passes you. It's essential. We are in a race, Paul says so. We are in a wrestling match. And Satan is trying to pin us so that we cannot use the gifts God has given us for the glory of Christ. Moses is flat on his back and the count has reached two, almost three. Moses has just barely got one shoulder up above the mat and the referee is about to pound him out. Moses has been pouting for 40 years. Moses has already thrown in the towel. And God says, Moses, I called you to a fight. And it's time now, get up and go to Egypt. What has God called you to do? What has God placed on your life that God wants you to do? You are important in the plan of God. Of course God can use somebody else. But if God has called you, you are the one he's going to use. Don't fight it. Don't argue with God. Don't get God mad at you. That's what happens next week. We'll see next week. How God gets mad at Moses. No, Moses is stubborn and disobedient, doesn't want the job. He'd rather drag dirty sheep around the desert than become God's point person to confront the mightiest world ruler and conquer the mightiest nation on earth. He would rather sit under a cactus baking in the sun than to become the greatest prophet and the greatest lawgiver in the history of Israel. Stubbornness makes us do stupid things. And remember what God said about stubbornness. 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul lost the privilege of being king. He was the first king Israel ever had. Humanly, he was the most qualified man in the entire nation. Just like Moses was the most qualified man because he'd been raised in Pharaoh's courts. But he'd lost his first race. And so now he's pouting he's not going to run anymore. Did you get it? Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Children, are you stubborn when your parents tell you to do something? Older people, are you stubborn when your boss tells you to do something? Those of you who are retired, are you stubborn when you know what God's will is concerning the way that you should be living and what you should be doing? Are you stubborn on anything? God says, it's just like you were going out and sleeping around. It's just like you were going to the local Buddhist temple or the local Confucianist temple or the locust Hindu temple and bowing down in front of some kind of an idol and leaving your little flowers and food there for the idol. That's how God views it when you're stubborn. Well, we say it's our conviction. No, no, no. Unless it's based on the Word of God, it's not a conviction. It's stubbornness. Unless it's submitting and obeying God and refusing to do anything else except obey God, if it's anything else, it's stubbornness. And God says it's like iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion is like witchcraft. When you come right out and declare that you won't do it, that's the same as practicing witchcraft, and God curses witchcraft. Serious issues? I think they are. If Moses had pushed God much farther, what would God have done to Moses just like he did King Saul? God was merciful to Moses. He canned King Saul. 
Now let's look at Moses' excuse number two. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. That is a very, very weird answer. What it boils down to is this. Now look, God, there are better people for the job than me. Or, you know, God, you're pretty much on target most of the time, but this time you got it wrong. Here I am, Lord. Send somebody else. You hear how stupid that kind of answer is. Send by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Hello, Moses, are you there? God is sending by the hand of him whom he will send. Hello, Moses, are you reading me? It's you. It's your hand by which God is sending. Don't you remember what God just did with your hand? The old snake routine? The old leprosy routine? Send by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Moses, God has just been showing you something with your hand. When God gives you a job to do, then do it. Don't tell God that there are somebody else who is better at it. Of course God knows there are millions of people who are better at it. But God didn't choose them. God chose you. You don't like that kind of answer from God because it's humiliating. We think, well, maybe there's one other person who might be slightly better than I am. But God has millions of people who are better than you are. There are millions who are more talented than you. God has millions of people who are better at it than you are. God has millions of people who are taller and more handsome and more beautiful and more gifted and richer and more compliant and more personable and more everything than you are. But God didn't choose them. God chose you. And in your heart, you know what I'm talking about. You know what the call of God on your life is. And you know how you're being lazy and slothful and not doing it. Or covetous and not doing it. Or stubborn and not doing it. Or rebellious and not doing it. I don't know your heart, but God does. And you know it. You know what's there. Here we are again, back to that same old stubborn, proud resistance based on success depends on me. What a routine. No, you know what? Success depends on God. Nothing else and nobody else. So why then did God choose you? Well, Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 through 29. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So... You know, even the strongest men, you know, God can certainly take care of that in his greatest weakness. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, why did God choose you? Here it is, verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Do you know why Moses failed 40 years earlier? Because Moses was at the top of the stack at that point. Moses was the king of the hill. Moses was rich. Moses was powerful. Moses was smart. Moses was learning in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And you think about all the engineering skills, for example, that had to go into building the pyramids. Monstrous, huge blocks of stone cut perfectly smooth and square so they all fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. You think of the astronomy of the Egyptians. You think of all the different knowledge that they had concerning agriculture. Going back to Joseph, of course, and to the blessing of God. Moses was learned in it all. Math, science, arts, music, astronomy, you name it. But God had to bring Moses to the point for Moses knew he was nothing. The problem was, when God said, Moses, now I'm ready to use you, Moses got stubborn. 
you have to have God bring you down to that point. God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here is the reason why God does this. That no flesh should glory in his presence. It's not you that makes for success. It is God that makes for success. We cannot glory when there is success. The success story belongs to God and to God alone. He alone deserves the glory. So instead of telling God to send somebody else, what should we say? Listen to how Isaiah responded, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, the burning ones. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah understood how filthy and how dirty he was. How little and how insignificant he was. And he trembled because his eyes had seen the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth. Jehovah of armies, he had seen Christ in all of his glory. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. Picture this. Think of an altar with burning coals on it. You can't touch them, they're too hot. And so you take tongs, and you pick up this coal off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. What did Moses hear from the mouth of God? Moses, who made man's mouth? God took the coals from off the fire and placed it upon the mouth of Isaiah the prophet. Oh, you say, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And God says, yes, you have unclean lips, but I can take the coal off the altar and put it on your mouth. You will have a word from me. It will be the word that I put into your mouth. It will be what I teach you to speak. Has God taken the coal and put it on your mouth? Moses wanted to resist that. Isaiah didn't. And listen to what it says in verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And here's the proper response. Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Moses, arguing with God, says, Send by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Instead of saying, Here am I, send me. What are you saying? Oh Lord, here am I. Send by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Let somebody else witness to my neighbor. Let somebody else witness to my co-worker. Let somebody else witness to my friend. Let somebody else witness to that guy walking down the street. Let somebody else witness to the guy that I'm sitting next to in the train station. Let somebody else do it. Send by the hand of him whom thou wilt send, instead of saying, here am I, send me. People, it applies to you. It applies to me. Do you not have a burning desire to see people who walk past you every day on the road to hell, hear the good news, and come to Christ. It's not you that brings the success. 
It's the word of God that's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You have the word. Is it not as a burning coal on your lips? Here am I. Send me. Our time is up, but I want to give you at least a couple of more illustrations of this. Listen to how Abraham responded. Ready to hear the voice of God means ready to obey the voice of God. This is at the sacrifice of Isaac. Genesis 22:11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said unto him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Same thing that Isaiah said. This is how Jacob responded. This is when God protected Jacob from scheming Laban. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here am I. See how Jacob responded with obedience that begat 400 years in Egypt, from which God is now telling Moses to deliver Israel. Israel took his journey and all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered. He's already known that uh, his son Joseph is alive, and so he's heading south. And he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hands upon thine eyes. And Jacob arose up from Beersheba. And the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives and the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry them. Here am I. And he went. Listen to how Samuel responded. As a child, children, and we have some here. Children, are you ready to hear and obey when you know God has called you to do something? Are you ready to hear and obey no matter what he calls you to do? If you answer yes, God can use you in a mighty way. Commit to obedience even before you know the will of God for your life. Listen to how Samuel responded. And he was taught that this was the right way to respond when he was a little child and when he heard God speak. Listen to this passage and pay attention to that. You children and young people are sitting here being taught. Samuel was taught by Eli what to say when God called. The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. He heard a voice, but he wasn't sure where it was from yet. He thinks it's from Eli. But how did he respond? Here am I. When you hear the call, do you respond, Here am I. I'm ready. What is it you want me to do? And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel! And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. He didn't just keep lying there and waiting for somebody to get him. When your parents call you to get up in the morning, do you lie there and wait until they scream and yell at you and come and pull the covers off and jump you out of bed? That wasn't Samuel. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel! And Samuel arose, went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Interesting. Here is a call coming before Samuel knew the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and he said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Parents, are you ready for this? When the Lord calls your children, do you perceive the calling of God on their lives? How do you respond? Well, we better ignore it for now because, after all, I want you to be with me until I'm old and you can take care of me and, you know, all those kinds of nice things with all the family around and so on. Are you ready for the call of God on the lives of your children? 
Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. When the Bible talks about hearing God, it means to hear him with a view of obedience. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. This is the voice that's coming from heaven. The Lord himself came and stood, waiting for Samuel's proper response. The man who understood the call of God told him, what he should say and how he should respond. The Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel! Samuel! Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And what a message God gave to him. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli. Now Eli is the one who's just told him how to respond properly to God. I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I also will make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Very serious. That God would judge the house that is all the descendants of Eli. A man who like Saul was a chosen man from God. His house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Sometimes God calls us to do things that we're afraid to do. Even as children, God calls us to do things that we're afraid to do. But they are the right things to do. They're the things that we know God wants us to do that are pleasing in God's sight, that are obedient to his word, that are not a matter of our imaginations or our emotions, but things that are clearly laid out for us in Scripture, we're afraid to do them because someone might criticize us. Someone might do something to us if we did that. Oh my, how they would mock us or scorn us. Or, among little kids, even beat us up. Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit, and hid nothing from him. Young people, how often do you try to hide things from your parents? I have, at various occasions, have people trying to hide stuff from me. It always outs. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did that none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Commit to obeying the Lord even before you know what it is that God wants you to do. Make that commitment. Say, God, I don't know exactly what you want me to do with my life, but I'm going to commit it to you now because you know what's best and you will empower me to do whatever it is that you called me to do. Now, the punchline. The response of all these men that we've seen, and even of the little child Samuel, and there are many others that we can go into, but that gives you the illustration. Here am I, I'm ready to obey. Here am I, what is it you want me to do? Here am I, I won't argue with you, I'll do what you tell me to do. That's what we see in every one of those passages where we saw that, here am I, it's the, I'm ready to hear with a view of obedience. 
Listen, do you realize that that is exactly how Moses responded at the burning bush until he heard what God wanted him to do? Look back at verse 4 of chapter 3. And when the Lord saw that he, that is Moses, turned aside the sea, that is the burning bush, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he's calling him by name, you will be called by name, you are an individual. God is not just throwing out a general call here. He's going to give a specific call on your life at some point in your life. Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Moses responded that way until he knew what it was that God wanted him to do. All the rest who responded this way did what God told them to do. Moses is the only one who resisted after he heard what God wanted him to do. You know, all of us, I think, or I certainly hope so, that all of us want God to speak to us in his word. The question is, are we ready to obey when we understand what he says? You have to commit to obedience before you seek the will of God for your life. You must resolve to obey before you can hear what God wants you to do. Moses had a general idea of what God wanted him to do, and he you know, jumped the starting line, killed an Egyptian, and had to spend 40 years in the wilderness as a result. Do you want God's blessing and direction in your life? I hope you do. If you want God's blessing in your life, make the commitment to obey now, even before you know God's will. And that will make it so much easier when you finally find out what the will of God is for your life. Remember, God can use you no matter what your weakness, what your inability. In fact, it's best for you to know your inability and your weakness because God chooses the base things of the world. God chooses the weak things of the world. God chooses the nothings of the world so that he gets all the glory. So don't use an excuse, I have this physical problem, or I have this emotional problem, or I have this mental problem, or I have this kind of whatever problem. I don't have enough money, I don't have a this, that, or the other. Don't use that as an excuse. That's the Moses excuse, and God got mad at Moses for using it. Because success does not depend upon you. Success depends upon God. Just be ready to obey. Here am I, send me. God in his mercy and in his anger had already prepared Aaron, Moses' older brother, to come to the spot. God knew in advance, of course, how Moses was going to respond. God knew what Moses would say. God knew what God would say. God had already called Aaron, and we'll find that out in the next couple of verses. Aaron is on his way to meet Moses. And Aaron doesn't have the problem with Egyptian, even if Moses thought he did. Have a, I'm kind of rusty in Egyptian, Lord. You know, 40 years ago, I, I, I spoke it for pretty good, but I, I can't speak Egyptian anymore. All I can speak is Southern Desert. God will use Aaron, but Moses is the man that God has chosen for the job. And Moses, just like Jonah, is going to get the job done and is not going to get out of the job, even though he has tried his very hardest to avoid the responsibility. Are you trying to avoid responsibility that you know God has placed on your life? Are you trying to avoid the call, trying to turn a deaf ear toward what God has for you in your life? Or do you say, here am I. Send me. You've taken the coal from off the altar. You've touched my mouth. Even though I have unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Even though my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But, oh God, you're the, man, the one who made man's mouth. Fill my mouth with words of praise and joy and gladness and testimony for Christ to all those who are around me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the incredible lessons that you teach us from the life of Moses. It makes us realize how stubborn we are, how rebellious we are, how argumentative we are, how... We refuse to do what you want us to do. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. 
You're the one when you call and tell us to go, expect us to go. To do. To obey. We don't know why. We don't know what it is that you have in mind. We simply are told, get up and walk. Lech lecha. Help us to learn to do it. Father, you are the God who has made all things and you have made us. We are your children. We are your sheep. We're not always in tune. We pray, Father, that you will gently lead us and guide us and direct us and provide for us as the shepherd, for you have promised to do so. But we also pray that you will put steel into our backbone to obey and to do even when it seems impossible, even when it seems distasteful, even when it seems difficult. Because success depends on you. It does not depend on us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing